comrades, and welcome back to Ushanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. В эфире программа Ушанка Show. My name is Sergey, and I was born in the USSR. You are a fucking agent. All of your pictures are bullshit. Your arguments, too. Look, inequality on USA. USSR was a young country developing. You would be better than China is today. You were an anti-communist. Just accept it, brother. The opportunities you claim are nothing compared to millions of Americans. And are not in Russia because migrated. USSR gave you everything, hypocritical scumbag. Anyway, well, I want to say thank you to my viewer, Licia, who lives in Finland, for this wonderful performance and reading one of those mean comments that I receive all the time. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about Soviet dachas, and this is part two. Someone posted a question of what the origins of the word dacha, and you know, I never thought about it, I always use that word, but never thought about origins. It's actually quite interesting. There is a Russian verb, davat, davat, which means to give, and a word dacha came from davat, so something that was given, so davat, dacha, so they'll be almost like a giver, or something like that, so that's the origin of the word dacha, so originally there'll be a tsar or some large landowner that will give a summer home to somebody, and that will become dacha. And there is a very similar word, zdacha, so just like dacha, but with the letter S in the front of it, so it's dacha. And it means change. So if you buy something for $10, but the price is $9.50, you get in change, you get in zdacha. So something given back to you, zdacha. Zdacha also means uh, fighting back. So if somebody was uh, punching you and you fight back, it says, te dal zdachi, you gave punch back. So that's another meaning for zdacha, change or fighting back. Dacha and zdacha. If you watch my first video about dachas, I mentioned that uh, Soviet people were allowed to cultivate exactly six sotkas. So sotka is one hundredth of the hectare. And there was actually a reason why uh, was exactly six sotkas, not ten, not fifteen, just six. Some Soviet smart scientists and agriculture scientists calculated that six sotkas are plenty to provide enough food for family of four people. Just enough so there will be no extra to sell on a market. So six sotkas are plenty, according to the Soviet calculations, to produce enough potatoes, carrots, and tomatoes for the family of four. If you ever wondered how much produce was produced on those private plots in the Soviet Union, uh, there is a really interesting book called The Private Sector in the Soviet Agriculture. I have it. I bought it on Amazon not long ago. And according to that book, uh, private plots in the Soviet Union produced 64% of all potatoes 43% of all vegetables. Meanwhile, those private plots were only 3% of the whole agriculture land being cultivated in the Soviet Union. So 3% of the land produced 64% of all potatoes and 43% of all the vegetables. That's astounding. So this is quite a bizarre situation. We have same land, same people, is the difference on dacha, People work for themselves in the collective farms, they work for the government, and as a result, productivity is just so different. And these numbers are being confirmed by modern reality. Back in the day, Soviet Union ended up spending millions and millions of dollars every year purchasing grain from Canada, United States, Australia. And now, if you look at statistics, Russia is number one exporter, not importer, but exporter of wheat in the world. Ukraine is number five. So what changed? It's the same land, same people, but now there is no more kolkhozes in uh, Russia or Ukraine. So productivity went through the roof. They bought modern equipment. They work for themselves, and suddenly. Russia has excess of wheat, while the Soviet Union had 
sharp shortage of wheat. But let's go back to the topic of dachas and growing potatoes. You might ask why potatoes were so popular to grow and the only explanation I can think of is, uh, think of Ireland. And remember in the potato famine, uh, potatoes always were food of poor people because it offered a uh, high calorie output and high yield on a small uh, plot. So you can uh, feed uh, quite a large family from the small um, uh, plot, which was calculated it's enough of uh, six sotkas to feed the family of four in the Soviet Union. And potatoes weren't that expensive to purchase. Uh, back in the Soviet days was 15 kopecks per kilogram in the state uh, stores. On the bazaars, uh, price usually was double. So you can find uh, potatoes for 30 uh, to 40 kopecks per kilogram. But of course, quality was quite uh, more premium. So I believe this calculator a little bit. Uh, so at 15 kopecks per kilogram, an average salary around 150 rubles um, back in the 80s. And looking at cost of potatoes right now at local supermarket, it's, I found $2.99 for a five pound bag. And as for the rusted potatoes, and of course you gotta keep in mind, uh, potatoes in American supermarket, they're pretty much like a bazaar quality in Soviet Union or better. They're large and nice potatoes. So probably should be calculated at 30 kopecks per kilogram, not 15. But anyway, to pay 15 kopecks per kilogram will be equal of having a salary of $1,320 a month and pay uh, 299 for five pound bag of potatoes. So this kind of gives you idea uh, and relation in potatoes. So Soviet worker could purchase 1000 kilograms of potatoes for his monthly salary. Similarly, American worker, uh, that means his salary will be $1,320 to purchase same amount of potatoes modern day. So when we're talking comparing apples to apples, in this case, we're going to compare potatoes to potatoes. So 150 Soviet rubles will be having the same purchasing power in potatoes as $1,320. So roughly $8 per ruble. I usually say $10 per ruble. That's what math comes to. So I have to throw this one in just to give you some idea about the costs. So remember, Soviet Lada in the 80s was about 9,000 rubles and nine year waiting list. So picture you're making $1,300 a month cash because we technically didn't pay taxes. And 9,000 rubles times 10. So a car will be $90,000. So you're getting paid $1,300 a month to buy a new car. It's $90,000 and with nine years of waiting list. This is quite bizarre how expensive the cars were in Soviet Union. And now let's talk about your questions. Uh, Curtis was asking, as far as you know, are Dacia still a thing in the former Soviet Union? If so, do they still fulfill the same purpose? That's a good question, which I don't have really good answer because it depends, of course, but I think it went three different ways. What you see on this picture, it's a satellite shot of Glivaha Orchard Array. It's called Glivaha 3 and Glivaha 4. So this is a giant area which has, I don't many, know how many lots, thousands of lots, tens of thousands of lots. So those lines are streets. So this area was developed sometimes in 70s. It was keep on growing. And that's why my friend uh, have a lot. I just asked him uh, and he said confirmed that they still own the lot but they just don't go there anymore because Alex lives in America and his mother in her late 70s so she can't um, grow anything on the lot. She's too old for that and actually even before in 80s she if I remember Alex told me that she went there to relax and read the book while her husband late husband was digging and planting and doing stuff. So for her, it was always for to relax. And uh, now it's just empty, abandoned lot. Now here's the same Glivaha Dacha area, but closer shot. And you could tell there's not a lot of open fields that people grow crops, quite a few trees and quite a few large buildings. 
especially if you look up on the top there's a blue roof that house is huge it looks like it's taken pretty much 50 percent of the whole lot so definitely people use a lot their um, dacha lots for summer homes because homes got bigger and uh, less land is being cultivated so now it's more about having a summer home and here's actually a dacha for sale glivacha 12 kilometers from kiev will sell and it's interesting it says pod reconstruction so it's pretty much sounds like the house is in bad poor condition so it uh, needs to be reconstructed so pretty much taken down and new and rebuilt i apologize i didn't uh, calculate in square feet but uh, area is 27.5 square meters i think it's maybe times nine so roughly 300 square feet and that's including kitchen and uh, living room walls are uh, wood and clay very interesting roof made out of metal shading probably stolen got electricity and natural gas so that's impressive so it has a well so no water no running water has a cellar uh, lot size is 0 0.06 hectare your six uh, sotkas it was privatized uh, five minutes walk to the train station 100 meters to the woods and the price twelve thousand nine hundred dollars that's a lot of money for pretty much and this is a little tiny lot for sale with electricity and natural gas and you need to build a brand new home and as i mentioned earlier after some uh, remodeling parents move out to the dachas and they, they stay there full time so kids can have apartment in kiev or moscow because housing is so expensive these days to purchase you know moscow totally insane prices in kiev it's pretty bad so it makes sense financially to invest money to upgrade dacha you know insulate walls put some heating and then parents stay there all year round and kids stay in the city and use dacha as a summer home and when i was researching for this video i discovered there's a a lot of uh, websites right now in russian that dedicated to designing homes for dacha lots so it's standard six sotka's lot and they have special plans how where to put the house where plan you know have some plants trees and maybe greenhouse so there's a different designs how you can arrange your summer home on this little tiny lot and some homes are quite cute i was impressed they actually great uh, two-story designs look really good okay so next question from karen is it true that in russia it was putin who gave ownership to people who had their dacha from soviet times from what i saw the dacha was for growing nicer things and closer to town and potatoes were grown in the march much larger separate field further out of town okay so with privatization it's kind of interesting so original privatization was only about uh housing so like people who had apartments they didn't own them during the soviet days they had affordable rent and under comrade yeltsin in 1991 uh, they began privatization so you could apply free of charge and transfer ownership to yourself and then of course you have to pay for services and that's what people complain now that it becomes really expensive to own an apartment uh, meanwhile dachas uh, no one touched that topic till 2001 so you're correct under putin um, they began privatization of dachas and initially in 2001 uh, people were offered to buy those lots not just transfer free of charge but to buy them and the price will be set up by the local authorities so of course as closer you to moscow or kiev is more expensive those lots and a lot of people couldn't afford it you know so there was this limbo people still have a right to uh, grow crops or have a little uh, dacha building on the lot but they couldn't afford to buy it out so that uh, lasted till 2006 and in 2006 uh, they called amnistia so they actually allowed people to transfer ownership you know privatize the lots without paying money uh, so yes that you're correct it happened under putin but pretty much anything for the last 
for 18 years happen under Putin. And the next question from David. Uh, thank you, Sergey. I learned a lot from this video. I was just wondering when people would bring their potato harvests back to the city in the fall, where did they store them? I was just curious. My parents used to store them in our basement, but I was curious about where you could store them in an the apartment building. This is actually a really good question, so sit tight. I have a lot to tell you about storing potatoes in the winter. So that's a really great topic, so let's uh, dig into it. Option number one, you could just leave your harvest of potatoes right there at the Dutch a lot. Uh, there is the way, it's old, old ways of storing potatoes. My grandparents uh, used to do it in the northern Ukraine. In the northern Ukraine, they call it uh, kagata. In Russian, it's called burt. And it's really uh, easy. You pretty much dig a, a wide, shallow trench. Uh, you lay straw down. Then you dump all your potatoes. Then you cover it again with straw. And then you cover with dirt. Make sure you have some paths uh, for ventilation because your potatoes need to breathe. And then some people will throw plastic on the top to protect it from rain. So this way potatoes will be kind of in this comfy uh, temperature that will be maintained by the ground and may not be too wet or too dry. So they just kind of stay asleep. And then you can come back uh, in the winter when you need more potatoes and just kind of go into this burt or kagata and get a bag or so and take it home and the rest will stay there. Of course, the backdrop of such thing, if people will try to borrow your potatoes and you live in the city and most uh, Dutch houses are abandoned for winter, then somebody can steal your potatoes. Option number two, to have your own cellar in the city. This is pretty wild, but it was quite popular. And so the people will have a, you know, five story high apartment, which usually Khrushchevka or more modern nine story high apartments. Then if there's any uh, lots, land around that not being in use, people will dig their own cellars. And this is what you see in the pictures. Then you have a lid with the lock, of course, maybe ventilation pipes. And people just bring their potatoes and they store those cellars. So they'll be individual, these little cellars spread around the buildings. And in some cities they were so uh, prevalent, I think is the word, you know, popular, that local uh, alcoholics, there'll be expression, uh, let's go have a seat on the, on the cellar. So it means they just use the cellar doors like in convenient benches to sit down and drink. So that's the option number one, to have your own little cellar, pogrib, right in the city. And that's where you store your potatoes. Option number two, using basement in your building. So of course, as you mentioned, uh, David, you, your parents had basement. Well, every large building also has basement. There's a lot of, you know, piping and all that going on. And if that basement is dry, uh, quite often uh, people who lived in that apartment building, uh, they will have access to the basement. They'll have a, you know, lock on a door. And they will actually, um, like, make little tiny rooms out of, you know, make wooden walls in the doors. And each, you know, person who lived in that apartment building have a little storage area and that's what they bring their potatoes and other goodies like canned goods and that's what they use for storage right there in the basement of the building but of course the risk is if pipe bursts and uh, floods the basement then uh, you down sun and that was another popular way of storing your stuff is in the basements of the buildings unfortunately our apartment building we always always had problem with leaky pipes so our basement was always wet, always didn't smell good, so there was no chance we could use it. Option number three, if you live on the first floor and you have a balcony, then you can dig your own tiny cellar. And that was another cool thing uh, some people did, and that kind of tells you that there was no really like a strict adherence to the rules. If you live on the first floor, you can just uh, extend your balcony down to the ground then you just uh, break the hole in your floor and your balcony, have an access lead stairs, little ladder, and then down there you have a tiny storage area, a tiny uh, basement you consider a cellar. So if you lived on the first floor, quite often people uh, made their storage areas 
still in the space below the balcony. So that's another popular thing of creating additional space in those tiny Soviet apartments. My family lived on the second floor, so building our own cellar was out of options. Our basement and our building, as I said, was always wet, so we didn't have that option. So my dad, as you see in this video, he built the insulated box on the balcony and he utilized uh, just whatever he had. So this is actually linoleum. So there's like a vinyl uh, flooring that he wrapped uh, with some insulation and you know, I put insulation and he wrapped it with the vinyl. And that's what we used our family to store potatoes. I believe it, that you could fit at least three bags, large sacks of potatoes. So that's what we're going to bring in the fall from the villages and dump in there. And the uh, balcony is unheated, so it's getting really cold in the winter. But uh, in that box, potatoes maintain their own temperature and uh, we usually had no problem. It's just, you know, over the winter it was getting harder and harder to get to the bottom because you just had to dive pretty much to get the potatoes that were all the way in the bottom. I don't think my uh, family used that box anymore because now potatoes actually became quite cheap and the quality is way better. So no one bothers to do that. It's just people um, go and buy potatoes at the stores anytime they need it. So all this kartoshka potato topic is really close to my heart because I grew up planting potatoes in the spring, harvesting potatoes in the fall. And of course, if you ever familiar with whole technique, I mean, it's all manual labor. It's easy to plant. You know, you just kind of dig shallow holes in the ground, dump a potato, a half of a potato, then you cover it with dirt. And then, of course, when you dig them by hand, it's way harder because there's way more potatoes. And I usually would just um, get on my knees. So my mom, for example, would be like using the shovel to turn over the dirt with potatoes. And I'll be on my knees just going through the soil and grabbing all the potatoes. So, yeah, that uh, was a huge part of my life. And I still feel really warm and fuzzy every time I see this pictures of harvesting or planting potatoes. Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this video. Maybe learned something new. As always, don't forget to like this video, share with your friends, and we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. shoot me an email if you would like to have a signed copy. Thank you! And if you love my channel and would like to show your support, please click on the link below this video and become the patron of the Oshanka Show. For as little as one dollar you can help us grow and create the new interesting videos about the life in Soviet